Matthew 21. We're going to be looking at verses 33 uh, through 46 today. So verses we didn't get to last week while Santos was here, and, but today we're going to make it. Verses 33 through 46. Have you ever had the pleasure of renting property? You lease out your house, your apartment, and you expect to get that fruit of financial profit? You interview a potential tenant and everything sounds so nice, they sound so sweet, but then they sign the lease, and there they are. You know, I haven't rented property myself, but I've kind of come along after there's been, uh, I've rented, and I've kind of come along behind other people that haven't been the best of tenants. Um, you know, some people trash the houses. Uh, the last house we rented before they had to put all new appliances back in because when the people moved out they took all the appliances with them um, one house we looked at we didn't rent this house because it smelled so bad was they treated the inside of the house like a kennel just all of these things you know that can happen when you rent property let alone not getting paid We'll discover as we're looking at this parable, the parable of the vine dressers. Here. That this is what the leaders of Israel were doing to the land or to the people, to the children of Israel. It's like they were acting like renters. And. You will get the story in a minute, the background in a minute, but we're going to see here, you know, God was calling on them. God desired that they would bear fruit for the kingdom of God, for his purposes, to be a light to the Gentiles, to, you know, glorify his name. But we'll also discover here that we have a similar opportunity to bear fruit. And we need to watch out lest we have the same problems come to the same end that they did. And first of all, in verses 33 through 39, we see that God is looking for fruit from our lives. As he begins here, hear another parable. That word another means another of the same kind. There's being a, a comparison or, a you know, he's continuing to add in here kind of like, uh, spiritual one-two punch. There was a certain landowner, as the parable goes here, who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers. Basically, a vine dresser is a farmer. Somebody contracted to come and take care of to farm the land. And then he went to a far country. Now when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. Jesus had just taught the parable of the two sons, remember. And now he's adding this parable. This parable of the vine dressers. This landowner buys a vineyard, buys this piece of property, and gets it all set up. He get, digs out a wine press, puts a hedge around it for protection, uh, builds a tower. You know, and it's interesting, some different commentators look for things that all these things represent, like the, like the hedge being the law and the tower being God's protection and all that. But, 
don't have to worry about that. Normally in parables, there's one focus, one central focus. And the central focus really on here is the comparison here of the Jewish leaders to the vine dressers and what was taking place, what was happening there. A lot of the details here aren't of particular importance. But it's interesting that a vineyard is another one of those types. You know, we talked about a fig tree being a type of Israel, but a vineyard also is as well. Um, mentioned so in Deuteronomy 32, 32, Psalm 80, verse 8, Jeremiah 2, verse 21, and Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 7, which we'll get a little bit of a look at later. But the landowner leases this land out. He's got it all set up, but he wasn't going to be around to do it himself. This was an investment for him. So he leases it out to the vine dressers and then goes on a long trip. Now, when the harvest time comes, he sends his servants to receive fruit from the vineyard. Jesus is saying that there was this expectation of fruit from the nation of Israel, first of all. That he was expecting some return. He was expecting them to live uh, according to his words. And as I said, be a light to the Gentiles. Now there is an expectation of fruit from the church as a whole and from individual believers as we'll kind of look at as we continue. We become fruitful when we become doers of the word and not hearers only, as James says in verse, James chapter 1, verse 22, to be doers of the words and not hearers only who deceive ourselves because if we just listen to the word, if we just come here and just take it all in. You know, you've heard the analogy of the dead, the difference between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is alive, full of fish and everything because not only does it have the Jordan River going into it, it has the Jordan River going out of it. So it's giving out. Whereas the Dead Sea just receives. Just takes, 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 takes. And so, it just has a lot of chemicals. And that's about it. And it tastes pretty nasty. It is fun to float on, though. But just have to be careful. I start, when, I, when we were in Israel, you know, I started to lose my balance. And I had to watch because, you know, I don't want to, you don't want to go forward. Because if you go forward, you go face down in the water. You get all that in your face. You know, it's cool to float back because you just... You know, it's really easy. It's like 70 some percent salt in the Sea of Galilee. That's why nothing lives there. Anyway, and the fruit that the Lord desires from our lives is primarily love. Galatians 5.22, and I'm of the perspective, I believe, that the things that come after that, the joy, love, the joy, the peace, the patience, gentleness, self-control, all of those things are actually manifestations of the love. That there's one fruit and it's expressed in those different ways. So what God desires to see come out of our lives is love for him and love for other people. Now, what had taken place with these Jewish leaders and why they weren't bearing fruit, what the problem was is that they basically walked away from a real relationship with the Lord and just had this outward religious formality where they could quote a lot, they could say a lot, they could tell you exactly why they do this and that, But they had no real relationship. There was no fruit coming because of that from, your li from their lives. Because as Jesus said in 
John chapter 15 when he talks about abiding in the vine and that's the only way you can bear fruit if we don't abide in him if we're not walking in a close relationship with Jesus there's not going to be any fruit from our lives and we'll become like Pharisees in that we'll know all of the right things to say and do and we'll settle around and criticize other people but there won't be any real fruit and God desires real fruit from our lives There's enough Pharisees out there. He wants to see the fruit of his spirit working through our lives. That being, as I said, love for him and love for other people. And it was these leaders' responsibility to aid the people in fruit bearing. They were to teach him the word and encourage him in walking with the Lord. That's why James says that there's not to be many Uh, teachers among you because they'll receive stricter judgment and that's what Jesus was dealing with here with these leaders they got a direct confrontation but even if a person's not a teacher they're responsible to bear fruit for the kingdom of God by living for Jesus because again going back to that analogy of the vine Fruit is an indication of a healthy vine. Fruit coming from our lives. Fruit in the life of the believer is evidence of a healthy relationship with Jesus. He continues in verses 35 through 36. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. In this, we see a clear illustration of the nation of Israel and what they did to God's servant, the prophets. The vine dressers take the owner's servants and beat one, like the prophet Amos was beaten by Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. They killed one as Isaiah was sawn in two by King Manasseh, as we're told in Hebrews 11.37. They stoned another as Jeremiah was stoned to death by the Jewish people in Egypt after they had gone down there. The same things were done to the second group that was sent, demonstrating that what they were doing was a settled condition of their hearts. It wasn't just, you know, oh, they were rebellious at this time and came back, but they continued to do these things. Repeated actions show heart condition. That's why it says in John, first, excuse me, first John chapter five, verse 18, is when it talks about how no one is born of God sins and sometimes we'll get confused by that and we'll think well we've all blown it we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and he said earlier in the the letter he said if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us so what does he mean here and when you look at it closely he's using a tense there, the present tense in, intending to describe that as a continuous action. So he's saying that no one is born of God, who is born of God continues in a daily consistent habit of sin. They'll not continually sin. You see, the fruit demonstrates the root. Now, this doesn't mean that, okay, if I do one sin one day and I do a different sin another way, oh, I'm continuing in sin, so there's something wrong with me, so my relationship with God's totally messed up. No, what he's talking about here is, do you know, if there's that that one issue, there's that one sin, And you continue to live in it. That's what he's talking about. 
you don't confront it, you don't deal with it, but you just allow it to go on and you, you know, just continue. I mean, obviously, with the Jewish leaders here, they had the problems of pride, covetousness, all of these things that they continued to do and justify. That's the difference. That's the difference. The question really is, you know, is your heart broken over your sin? It's like, oh, Lord. You know, and if it's, the scripture says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, that's what he desires to, uh, to ha be happening in our lives because of relationship that, yeah, when we blow it, we go to him. As Jesus said in Matthew 12, 33, a tree is known by its fruit. In fact, the tree is even named by its fruit. Apple tree. Guess what they grow? Pear tree. Banana tree. They're called by what they produce. Then the same thing should be true for that's why I love it when it says in the book of Acts that, you know, that simple statement that believers were first called Christians in Antioch. They were called that because of their fruit. In fact, that started out as an insult. They're Christians, their little Jesus is running around all over the place. That's why I never minded the term Jesus freak. You know, that we had during the, cool. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm freaky over Jesus. What are you freaky about? I didn't have a hard time with that. So people are identified by what they do. What they're about. Now in verses 37 through 39, we read, Then, last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Finally, last of all, the landowner sent his son, thinking that the vine dressers will at least respect him, show him the due respect, that common courtesy of being the son of the landowner. But of course, the parallel is clear. God so loved the world that he gave. He sent his only son into the world. Knowing exactly what we would do to him. What an incredible thing to do. Instead of honoring him for who he is, we crucified him. The vine dressers did what is always ill-advised for us people to do, is they said among themselves, they discussed it among themselves, that they would kill him and claim the vineyard. Now, just look at how irrational this is. There's this big dude landowner out there who owns the property, who owns it all. He sent his son to get the fruit because saying they'll respect my son they say discuss among themselves like I said which is always a foolish thing to do when you get people together and they sit around and pool their ignorance over a matter and come up with a decision and their decision was hey let's kill the guy we'll take the land forgetting the father forgetting the landowner the one who owns it all not considering what will he do. And so they commit this act. 
one of the reasons that the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus was in order to protect their position. As it says in John eleven forty eight, 48, where they were concerned that all the people were starting to believe in Jesus and they wanted to kill him because they were afraid that they would lose their place and their position. That the Romans would come, would come down on them. This is why it's important that we submit our lives to Jesus as Lord. Otherwise, we seek to build our own kingdoms and do things that are contrary to his. If our lives aren't submitted to him, if we're not abiding in him, if we're not looking to him, depending upon him, our tendency is then to do things for ourselves. And doing those things become our own little kingdom. And yeah, we might want Jesus to come. Lord, you, you can come and help me out on what I'm doing. But certainly don't step on my toes in any way. And tell me to give it up to you. And when we do things like this, you know, and this is what gives the world such a bad taste for Christianity when you have people that claim to be Christians but are living the type of lifestyle that the world lives, which is totally for themselves. Yes, when you see those goofy guys on TV, send your money, send your money. Well, if, if just sending your money would cause blessings, why don't you tell, why don't those people just send their money out? Those people that are asking for yours. If that was true, they should be calling you up and sending you money. Again, as we saw last week, it's always a mistake to take a vote to decide what's right or wrong. You know, often when we do those things and, you know, we get together with other people and look for other people's opinions, we're just trying to affirm our own bad decisions. So they took the son as they took Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They cast him out of the vineyard as Jesus was cast out from the council of Caiaphas and taken outside of the city and led up and crucified on Calvary. And like we always find is that we are always involved in fulfilling the plan of God. The plan of God is never thwarted. No matter what people do. If we are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, we fulfill the plan of God as a fellow heir and a co-laborer with Christ, bearing fruit and sharing in the blessing of it. But if we reject Jesus as Lord of our lives, we'll still be involved in the fulfillment of the plan of God, but in a negative sense. And we'll have no share in the benefit. And as we see in verses 40 and 41, being unfruitful, not bearing fruit, will cause a person to be passed by. It says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine dressers? Jesus asked the obvious question here, what will the landowner do? He's using this parable to lead them to an obvious conclusion, to make an obvious decision, to see the spiritual truth that they are missing, though it's right in front of their faces. 
as the vineyard belongs to the landowner, Israel belongs to the Lord. That's why it's kind of interesting to me when you just look at the land and all these arguments over who owns the land. Well, the land belongs to God. He leased it to Israel. These other folks messing with it are in for trouble. Because there's a landowner here <laughs> that has to be dealt with, that will be dealt with. That's why I find it interesting that there's that one book called Eye to Eye <clears throat> that, that relates every time we as a nation have tried to uh, force Israel to trade land for peace and every time we've had some major natural disaster <laughs> after that. So it's like, let's be careful there, guys. Um, you see, the leaders of Israel are then therefore directly accountable to God. Those who mess with Israel are touching the apple of his eye, which is like, the apple refers like to the pupil. It's like, you're going to go stick your finger in God's eye and not expect a response? That's used in reference that way in Deuteronomy 32.10 and Zechariah 2.8 in case you're taking notes and you like to write it. Where did he get that? And then, then you'll know. It's expected that they will bear the consequences of their actions. So God takes it very personally when people mess with his people. He always has. He always will. These are my chosen people. And we see the same thing is true with the church. When Jesus knocks Saul of Tarsus off his horse on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, you know, he hadn't a clue. He would, Jesus took it very personally that Saul, who would later become Paul, was persecuting his people. He saw it as persecuting himself. So I would suggest that the ladies on The View uh, be careful of the things they say. In case you didn't hear, there was a statement by one of the ladies on that show, The View, made a statement about Pence's, Vice President Pence's faith, indicating he was kind of crazy for being a Christian and believe what Christians believe. So... Just be careful. Like the scripture says in Galatians, don't be deceived. God won't be mocked. Whatever a man sows that he will also reap. And it also says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out. No sin is just ignored by the Lord. There are no free passes given because of the perfect righteousness of God, someone has to pay. I used to listen to Keith Green a lot back in the day, back in the 80s. And those of you who remember, remember that one song. Some people won't find out till it's too late that you have to pay the price. You can pay it yourself. Then he adds the little note, ha, or, you'll let, or let somebody else, but who would be that nice to pay a debt that isn't his? And he says, I know someone like That's the choice there. He actually chose to pay the debt for us. And we can either 
receive forgiveness or seek to pay the debt ourselves. Verse 41 reads, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. The Jewish leaders respond that the obvious, you know, the only obvious answer, boy, that dude will totally wipe them out. Jeez, that's crazy to kill the landowner's son, which they would do in just a couple of days. They're pronouncing judgment upon themselves. But we should always be careful of condemning others. Pronouncing judgment. You might find, as, they, as these Jewish leaders did, that they were judging themselves in the process. Because, as the saying goes, my sin looks really bad on other people. But what we should do is simply share the word of God, share what the word says, and let him work in hearts. Let him convict people. We don't need to judge in a condemning sort of way. But to simply share, hey, this, you know, I see you're struggling here. This is what the word says. Interesting statement here. There's kind of like a play on words here in the Greek where it says he'll destroy those wicked men miserably. What it really says is more along the line, he will destroy these wicked men according to their wickedness. There's that connection, that relationship there. Because people act out their own nature. All are subject to sin because of the old nature from Adam. We receive a new nature in Christ that we are to put on as Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says. Also Romans 8 to a verse that Jim Gallagher shared with the guys last week. And it gave a really cool perspective on it, you know, explaining it very clearly. The verse is, for the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. There's this law of sin and death that we are under because of Adam. That we sin, we commit sin and continue to do that and the ultimate consequence is death. But the law of the spirit of life has superseded that law. Now we can have life in Christ. Now we can walk with him and, and bear fruit. Now these leaders continue in their self-condemnation saying that that landowner will lease out the vineyard to other vine dressers. If you won't do what God called you to do, God will use somebody else to do it. The purposes of God will be fulfilled. But he has an incredible plan for each person's life. Each and every one of us. Things that he desires to accomplish. As Paul talked about how he was pressing on into all the things that God has for us. And it's our responsibility in our relationship with him to know what he's called us to to be and to do and to press on in that. But the interesting thing is, you know, as he said, he desires fruit from our lives. And as it does say in John chapter 15 as well, he will do what is necessary in our lives to bring us to the point where we bear fruit. 
You know, it says, it's, you know, when some people, you know, those who aren't bearing fruit, that he lifts them up. Well, what they would do back then is they, it wasn't that they'd just rip off the branch. He would take and lift, the vine dresser would, if a vine was on the ground, they would lift it up, prop it up, wash it off, you know, do what was necessary in that so that vine would produce fruit. God is working in each of our lives that there would be fruit from our lives. And that fruit, again, is the fruit of the Spirit, love going to other people so that other people see the love of Christ and come to him and come into a relationship with him. That's the purpose. That's, all, that's what all of this is about. To experience the love of Christ. As Paul said, which surpasses all understanding. And then to make the love of Christ, to allow him to so work in our lives that the love of Christ is revealed to other people. That's it. God, in dealing with the Jewish nation at this point, transfers the leadership to others, basically the apostles and the mission, and he turns the mission over to the church. Until, as we read in Daniel, the 70th week of Daniel, after the church is removed, and then he deals with them specifically again. God desires to use and to bless us. But if we refuse, he'll use someone else. The work of God will be done. But I want to be right in the middle of it. I don't want to be on the outside fringe, doing a little, I want to be right smack dab in the middle of the will of God for my life. Because that's the place of joy. That's the place of hope. That's the, that's the place, for lack of a better word, where you really get stoked. As there's nothing greater than serving the Lord in that. If you want to have a life that's truly fruitful, get close to Jesus and allow him to live his life through you, as Paul instructed in Galatians 2.20. But one more point here in the last several verses here, and that is fruitfulness comes from brokenness. As we read in verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He now becomes very pointed with the Jewish leaders. Now, you imagine he's standing there in front of all of these chief priests and scribes, both of which who were supposed The scribes were the interpreters of the law. They were the authorities. They were sort of like the Supreme Court in that they tell you exactly. And he says to them, guys, haven't you ever read this in the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is marvelous. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in his eyes. He's saying that there's something really obvious here if you would simply read it. Many people are ignorant of what the scripture says about issues simply because they don't read it. Soon after this, Jesus would tell 
the Sadducees that they're mistaken about the resurrection because they do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. You can know a lot of religion and not know the scriptures nor the one who wrote them. We should always be challenged to check out what God says because he's the final authority. Now Jesus begins to quote Psalm 118, which is a messianic psalm prophetically, which prophetically speaks of the things that were taking place that day. It speaks of Christ, the stone which the builders rejected, the chief or the Jewish leaders being the builders. Now, there was a traditional story at this time, and it's probably accurate, but you know, we can't be 100% sure. It's that when they were building Solomon's temple, they didn't quarry the stones. They were commanded not to quarry the stones right there because they didn't want, you know, in the temple precincts for there to be all this noise going on. So it was, the stone was quarried elsewhere and they would send the stones up to the temple mount. And they, at this one point early on, they got this kind of unusually shaped stone. And they, th they said, somebody must have made a mistake. This stone, this just doesn't fit anywhere. So they tossed it over the hill. And then they get, you know, they get the temple built and they have all of these, you know, other stones in place, these huge stones, if you've ever seen any of the stones over there, have them all in place. You know, some are so tight, you can't even fit a credit card through them. They're just, you know, you couldn't get it to go anywhere. But then they get, they say, well, wait a second, there's something missing. The cornerstone's missing. The capstone, the chief cornerstone, where is it? As they sent word back to the quarry, where's, come on guys, you're slacking. Where's the chief cornerstone? He said, we sent that to you a long time ago. The stone that the builders rejected was the chief cornerstone. And this is what we have taking place here with the Jewish leaders. But not to just look back at those guys and fault them. What's taking place in the world today? You can't even mention the name of Jesus. The world will go out of its way not to mention the name of Jesus. Certainly don't put the Ten Commandments anywhere. Don't read the Sermon on the Mount. Don't do any of those things. Get it out of our schools. Get it out of our public life. If we just get all of that out of the way, we can have this vineyard for ourselves. I think we'll find the end result will be very much different than the world expects. It seems that those who would like to build our society would build it according to their own image and they always reject Jesus. That's why when we minister on any level, whether it be, you know, practical, quote unquote, practical ministry like feeding poor, you you always have to have the gospel. You always have to share the gospel. Or otherwise, we're repeating the mistakes of those at the turn of the last century who were involved in the social gospel. Organizations you know like the YMCA. A lot of people today don't even know what those initials mean. Young Men's Christian Association. But there's... To be honest, nothing Christian about that organization anymore. They were founded to think, hey, we're gonna serve, we're gonna serve people. But 
didn't share the gospel. They weren't about salvation. They weren't focused on that. So it ultimately becomes about the programs with no heart or purpose. And yeah, you might have a lot of kids who have a place to go and take karate classes. But do you have anyone coming to know the Lord? The world would say you can do your good works, but leave Jesus and the message of salvation out of it. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's the one, as Colossians 1, 15 through 18 tells us, he's the one who holds the whole universe together. In verses 43 through 44, we see, Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom shall be taken from them and given to a nation that bears the fruit of it, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever the stone falls, it will grind him to powder. The kingdom of God will be taken away from them and given to a nation that will bear the fruit of the kingdom. Salvation has switched from being centered on the Jews to coming through the church which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles God has chosen the church through which to bring the message of salvation that means that each one of us are to carry the message to the ends of the earth that's why Jesus gave the Great Commission. Now Jesus moves to Isaiah chapter 8 verses 14 and 15 to explain that this stone will be a rock of offense. That's no great news. You know, that's pretty well known. There's no name that's more offensive in the world than Jesus. He'll be stumbled over. One way or another, every person will have to deal with Jesus. He's that immovable stone in the middle of the path of life. To fall on this stone means to be broken and surrender. We all have a choice in what we're going to do in respect to Jesus. The smart thing to do is to surrender our lives to him and be made over, to be broken and remade. The other option is not so positive because if we refuse to surrender, as he said, the stone will fall upon those in judgment. In Daniel chapter 2, we have recorded there Nebuchadnezzar's dream of all the world governing empires being depicted as a great statue. And Daniel interprets it, the dream for. Nebuchadnezzar. And as he sees this great stone, or excuse me, this great statue, then a great stone cut out, the scripture says, without hand, falls upon the feet of the statue and totally pulverizes it. This is a prophecy of Christ ultimately judging the nations. If we refuse to come broken to Jesus, the only other option is judgment. You can't say that that is unloving. No one can ever say that God judging is unloving because the one who's judging has nail prints in his hands.
verses 45 through 46. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Duh. What took you so long, guys? But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. The trap had been sprung. The chief priests and the elders finally figure out that Jesus was speaking directly to them. Have you ever felt like you were set up by the Lord? It's just one of those times, you know, it's like you're going through something, there is an issue there or some struggle you're having, and all of a sudden, you know, you come to church and that strange guy up front tells you something and it hits you right there. And then maybe you open whatever devotional book or whatever you're doing for your devotions in the morning, what portion of scripture you're in, and it talks about the same thing, and it's like, oh, I gotta get away from this. You get in your car, you drive, turn on the radio, and then some guy comes on and shares exactly the same thing. It's like, I give up. Okay, Lord, what do you want here? That's a great place to be, and it demonstrates the faithfulness of God, because as I said, he desires fruit from our lives. He desires in order to bless us, to give us an abundant, overflowing life, and the way that he does that is to work in our hearts and our lives that we bear fruit. The leaders wanted to lay hands on Jesus, but they feared the multitudes. Instead of repenting in dealing with Jesus, they hardened their hearts. Always a dangerous thing to do when God's dealing with you is to just resist and harden. Because it ultimately brings about judgment. It's much better to walk in obedience and experience the blessing of the Lord. So God desires fruit, that fruit is being produced through our lives and through us as a church and through the church as a whole. That fruit brings glory to him and advances the cause of the kingdom of God. If we'll allow him to work in our lives, if we won't do that, he'll use someone else. But as a believer, you should get real joy from knowing that you're being used by God for his purposes. In fact, have you ever been in one of those situations where, you know, unbeknownst to you, that you were just going along with your life and all of a sudden some circumstance came up and you sensed the presence of God in the middle of the situation as you shared with someone or this situation just popped up and you know you were talking and you were, and you were amazing yourself with your own words because you didn't know where it came from in the first place and you just see the Lord work in the circumstances and you walk away after the encounter and you think oh God used me. And honestly and sincerely, there is no greater privilege in the world than that. And that's what God desires for each one of us. That we would know him, walk with him, allow him to work in our lives, to have that abundant life that he desires for each one of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your incredible love for us, Lord. As your word says that, you know, while we were yet sinners, you died for us.
But Lord, your saving work doesn't stop there, Lord, because the process goes on as that salvation has, you know, as your word says. Whom you foreknew, who you foreknew, you also predestined to be conformed into your image of your son. And that you've created us in Christ Jesus unto good works which you've prepared beforehand that we should walk in. But Lord, we're never alone. You call, you equip, you fill, and you work through us, Lord God. And the blessing of it all, Lord, is doing this with you. Just knowing you in the midst of it all. There's nothing better than that. We thank you for it, Lord. And we love you. And we just pray that even this week, Lord, each one of us just might see your hand at work in our lives. And Lord, just look to what you would do with us this week, Lord. You have a purpose even for the rest of this day. Lord, help us to be open to your leading, obedient to your direction, and faithful to your calling. We thank you for that, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, bless you guys. If anyone needs further prayer, has any questions, uh, feel free to come up afterwards. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week in the Lord. Why don't y'all stand? <laughs>